Great. Well, thank you uh, very much for uh, inviting me here and, and for your attention. So I'm going to tell you uh, very quickly about two things um, that we've been involved in. One is the uh, Proteomic Standards Initiative, where we have been uh, developing and promoting standards for proteomics data sets. And the other thing I'm going to tell you about is this Proteome Exchange Consortium, which is uh, our attempt to bind together proteomics data repositories. So there are several different proteomics data repositories out there, and in order to get them to cooperate better, we have uh, developed this consortium. And so I'll tell you a little bit about these two things. So first I'll start with uh, the Proteomics Standards um, Initiative. So these are uh, how we would describe the um, deliverables of the PSI, as I'll call it. Um, the first uh, component that we have um, worked on extensively are minimum information guidelines, and so these are format independent um, descriptions of what information should be provided when you make proteomics data sets available to the, to the community or deposit them in repositories. Uh, the second component that we probably spent the most time on is uh, formats, and so we have historically worked on XML uh, XML-based formats, and so this is to encode the information that's both in the minimum information guidelines, but then also uh, additional information. Our formats are um, use quite extensively controlled vocabularies, so we have developed um, hierarchical uh, controlled vocabularies that help us describe the concepts in our formats. Um, and so that's uh, another component. Um, all the formats, uh, I'll show you a little, a little snippet of what some of the formats look like, but uh, control vocabularies is a key component of those. And then um, databases and tools. So as you're, of course, um, aware, uh, if you develop standard formats and there are no tools that use them, then nobody will use them. And so we put quite a lot of effort into developing software and tools and resources that implement these formats to, uh, to make them uh, be useful. And then coupled with that, community interaction. We go out and try to get people to, to use these formats and to deposit their data. And so I think one of the, the um, unusual and, and beneficial aspects of the PSI is this document process, which I'll talk a little bit about. So all of these products that we develop, we put through a document process, essentially a review process to um, ensure that they're as widely applicable as, uh, as possible. Um, so there's our website. Um, we have uh, a website with uh, information about all of these guidelines and formats that if you'd like to know more, you could uh, take a look there. Um, here is a, a partial list of the formats that we have been working on, and I don't want to go into detail on these. Um, they're probably not that uh, interesting to you, but as I said, um, you know, these are for different aspects of proteomics experiments. Most of them are XML based formats, so all the ML ones are XML based formats. We also have a few tab delimited formats, so we have we have essentially discovered that, that people um, will want to take some of these very complex and rich formats and boil them down into a very simple uh, tab based format so they can more easily get it into Excel or, or R or some other format. And so we've tried to help them out and, and come up with a standardized format for those. Most of these are essentially done. The two in the middle there um, with the stars are ones that we're still actively uh, working on here. So um, if you're having any interest in, in working with us to, uh, to try to finish those off, we certainly uh, welcome uh, participation. A particular note here are two formats which we've been calling ProBAM and ProBED. And so these are uh, we're our attempt at taking the very widely used BAM files and BED files popular in the genomics field and trying to map proteomics data into them. If you have proteomics data, peptides that you want to map onto chromosomal coordinates, for example, um, how can you do that in a relatively standardized way? So we went down the XML path many, many uh, years ago. Um, I remember in uh, around 2006, we had some initial discussions, should we use RDF? Should we start using RDF? And I think at the time, just based on the people who were there uh, at the meeting, there was not enough uh, experience in RDF and uh, there was a lot of experience in XML. And so that's how we, we kind of went down that path. Um, but instead of uh, using a very highly structured, very strict XML, we opted for a, sort of an XML skeleton, which has a, controlled, a lot of controlled vocabulary terms within that, uh, within that structure. 
which in some ways I think is sort of a half step toward um, RDF. Had we known more about RDF at the time, we, we might have gone down, that, uh, gone down that road. And then as I mentioned, these tab-separated formats that we have are really just simplified versions of the complex XML formats. And so just to give you a quick idea of, of what I mean, so this is uh, you know, some particular ion type element within our XML files. There are some uh, explicit uh, um, attributes and sub-elements that we have, but then we also have this sort of catch-all CV param uh, element in there, which allows us through some sort of a mapping file that tells you which um, CV params would be allowable in this context. Um, you can choose from a list of controlled vocabulary terms um, to be able to describe more information about the particular ion type that, uh, that you have. And so one of our aims is to try to maintain these XML formats stable over long periods of time because the vendors tend to complain and get, get frustrated when we change the, the schemas. And so we've tried to use this mechanism to keep the schemas stable but be able to adapt the formats for changing um, and new features uh, just based on the controlled vocabularies. Um, so you all are very familiar with controlled vocabularies. All of our controlled vocabularies are uh, sort of maintained within uh, an OBO mechanism and are available on OLS and a lot of the public, um, publicly maintained um, controlled vocabulary and ontology uh, portals. Um, I mentioned this document process. So in order to provide uh, a formal mechanism for uh, approval and ratification of these formats, we've, we've come up with this document process mechanism. Um, so when a proposed standard is, is completed by the group that's working on them, um, there are essentially three rounds of ratification. The first one, um, the proposal is handed to a PSI editor who then brings it to the PSI steering committee who give a quick review of it to make sure that it seems reasonable. Then the second process is an external reviewer process where the PSI editor will seek external reviewers um, very much like a journal review. And um, that tends to be a little bit difficult sometimes because most of the people who are interested in that, uh, in that for format or uh, that document uh, have actually been part of its um, development. So we have to try to find people who are interested but have not been part of the development. And then finally, the third part is an open community review. Once um, the document has gone through these first two rounds, been potentially adjusted, it's then posted publicly, essentially announcing that this will become an official PSI uh, product, and there is a 30-day or so review, 60-day review, where anyone can comment on it. And then once... Um, the original designers have addressed all of the comments that have been submitted. This becomes an official uh, PSI approved standard. Um, there's a paper we published in, in, uh, in AMIA um, uh, about two years ago, a pretty extensive description of the first 10 years or first 12 years of the proteomic standards initiatives. So the proteomic standards initiatives have been working since about 2002. And um, this provides a, a pretty extensive overview, if you're curious, on uh, some of these things. So uh, we usually have about 10 or so publications every year describing uh, formats, describing implementations of formats, um, and have been, uh, have been pretty successful. Um, you know, not everybody in the proteomics field uses these formats, but I think they've actually become quite... Um, quite well used. Uh, the people who appreciate open formats and like to write software that can use these open formats rather than the vendor formats, um, they have, I think, um, uh, adopted these, these uh, formats quite, uh, quite extensively. The organization of the PSI is something like this. We have different working groups. So there's an overall um, organizational uh, steering, uh, steering group, essentially. And then there are groups on mass spectrometry, uh, molecular interactions, proteomics, informatics, and then some of the um, um, the lesser, uh, the less active groups at the bottom. But essentially, these groups, uh, you know, get together and work on different aspects of proteomics uh, standard elements. Uh, we have been trying to reach out and working together with uh, other groups. So recently, we have been working with uh, several people in the metabolomics field. Um, originally, the Cosmos, there was a Cosmos grant. We've worked most closely with them, but now also the Metabolo uh, Metabolomics Standards Initiative. Um, we've held some joint workshops since uh, we have you know, a common uh, technology of mass spectrometry. 
um, we have been trying to work with them to try to expand the, the formats that we use and the knowledge that we've gained to uh, benefit the uh, proteomics, uh, so the metabolomics field as well. Um, similar to that, there's a, a mass a computational mass spectrometry group um, that is somewhat separate from the PSI. Uh, we've held some um, uh, workshops with them, and and there's there's uh, overlap in the people who participate in those. And something that actually has worked out quite well um, recently is we've held these uh, so-called bioinformatics hub events at some of the major conferences that uh, proteomics people attend. And essentially, what it is is a uh, either a room or a sort of a cluster of tables that have. Um, been designated as a place where the bioinformatics people um, tend to gather and anyone is encouraged to come and ask. If they have bioinformatics related questions, they can come and so-called ask the experts, but then it's also a way for the bioinformatics people to get together and discuss uh, events of interest. And uh, I think this is actually something that uh, uh, has been very successful for us and might be replicated in other aspects of bioinformatics as well. Um, every year we have a, a spring workshop, uh, which is in many ways uh, similar to this. We start off with a general symposium with, uh, with talks and presentations, and then the rest of the days we, we spend time actually working on these formats, discussing, uh, trying to make decisions that we've deferred over the year, uh, and create clear action plans on, on developing these, uh, these formats. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears quickly and just for the last uh, couple minutes here tell you about Proteome Exchange now. So the goal of Proteome Exchange, as I hinted at the beginning, was to provide a network of stable, um, coordinated uh, proteomics data repositories. Um, so historically there have been several of them and we hadn't uh, communicated very well. Uh, and it was often a question users wouldn't know, you know, which repository should I submit my data to. If they're looking for data sets, they would basically have to go to all of the repositories to look to see if they could find it. And so we wanted to solve some of those, um, some of those problems to make it easier for the users to access data. So, um, well, I just basically stated the goal. Uh, our, our primary aim, or one of the primary aims, was to make a really a user-oriented interface so that it would be essentially easy to figure out where a data set should be submitted, and where can we find data sets. And so the main repositories currently, um, the, the faces have changed a little bit over the years, but Peptide Atlas, which is where I'm from, Pride, is at EBI, um, and then Massive is at the University of California in San Diego. Those are the primary um, members right now. Uh, the JPost uh, team here in Japan has set up a repository and is teetering on the edge of joining the consortium um, as well. So um, there are many of uh, many common players between the Proteomics Standards Initiative and Proteome Exchange, and so um, I think they have been very um, beneficial to each other. Uh, the repositories rely on these open standards that have been developed as part of the PSI, and um, there's been a, a definite feedback mechanism between the uh, between the two groups. Um, I'm not going to go into any great detail on how this works, but essentially um, raw data comes into one of the repositories, and so we don't typically stipulate exactly which one. The users are free to deposit their data in the repository that they, um, they like best. There's a description at Proteome Exchange Central on the differences between the different repositories, but depending on geographic location and the types of data, you would submit to just one of those. Um, then the handling repository uh, essentially submits a, a message to Proteome Central, which then broadcasts to, to anyone who cares to listen that there has been a new data set deposited in one of these repositories, and this is the one where it is, and there's basic metadata about it, and then anyone can go and download those data sets. In some cases, a repository such as Pepper Atlas will go and automatically download those data sets and reprocess them and use those in ways that that um, are beneficial to, uh, to them. And so this is just a, a little screenshot essentially of what you get at Proteome Central at, uh, at Proteome Exchange. There's a, an, ex, uh, an advanced query interface and then just a basic query interface that allows you to look for data sets based on the metadata that has been stored at the portal. So the portal doesn't have any of the data sets themselves, just the metadata um, for, the, uh, for the experiments. And if you click on any one of those, um, all that information is available on a web page and then also available in uh, 
in an XML format, which is the basic communication mechanism between the different um, repositories. So with that, um, I'd like to just acknowledge uh, at least some of the people. Uh, these are many of the main players who have been involved in the Proteomics Standards Initiative um, and um, Proteomics Change. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>